Well, good day, everybody. Welcome back to the typewriter video series. Hey, I'm doing a review of a typewriter here, and this is a Remington 1040. No, I didn't just buy it. Actually, I have had this typewriter probably seven or eight years ago. Uh, I bought it, I'm thinking, I don't remember the exact date, but about roughly six years ago, I gave it to my young grandson, who was probably about five years old at the time. I knew he wouldn't use it that much, but I wanted to give it to him just to give him an opportunity to play with it and whatever. And it was a rugged typewriter, so I figured it couldn't get too badly damaged. But as it turns out, it basically spent most of those six years in their garage. And this weekend we were over there and I had the opportunity. I thought, oh, I remember that. Let's go. So I grabbed it out of their garage, took it home, and it was pretty dirty. It needed a lot of degreasing and cleaning and stuff. So hey, let's take a look at the Remington 1040. Well, this particular sample had a pretty rough carrying case and the zipper, of course, was totally shot. So as is my usual custom, I use these military style web belts to secure the case so it won't fall apart. But anyways, interesting case. I had done some repair jobs to the case. Uh, the inside of the case is black craft felt that I used some gaffers tape on. I don't remember what was wrong with the inside of it, but I, I did that. And then the hinge back here, I taped it with black gaffers tape also. And apparently that's held up quite well over the years. Um, so it has a semi-soft case and in the bottom of it there are two latches you pull, you push down and you slide it back and you can release the the uh, typewriter from this case. So it has this hardware, this mounting hardware in this semi-flexible cardboardy cardboard core plastic leatherette kind of surface here. So um, that's an interesting thing, right? Is I was thinking as I was cleaning the case this morning, I was thinking, you know what? If I really got ambitious, I might be able to uh, maybe buy a case, a different case, or actually make something and use that mounting hardware, right, to make a new case for it anyways. But I probably won't do that in the near future. Anyways, this is the Remington 1040. Let's take a look at it, shall we? Well, this typewriter was made in Holland, and I haven't actually looked up the serial number on the database, but I'm guessing it's probably somewhere around the 1970s. It does have a modern keyboard with a number one exclamation mark, U standard US style keyboard. Um, so let's talk about the condition first and that it was in when I got it, and then we'll talk about the features and all that. So. It was pretty gummy. A lot of the type bars were gummed up, so the type bars were hanging up. Uh, one notable thing was the ribbon color selector. Uh, in the red position, it would raise the ribbon, but in the black position, it would barely move the ribbon. Yeah, the line advance was kind of wonky, and uh, it was just really dirty and grungy and kind of sluggish. And so I ended up taking the body panels off to get to the chassis. And the body panels, taking them off is a little tricky. So there is a carriage lock here you slide forward. To take the body off, there's a screw in the back here, one here. Um, there's an articulating lid, right? And there are two screws here, right here. And then there are four additional screws underneath. And once you take all those screws out, you'll find that Getting this shell off is a real exercise and you have to kind of bend the two sides out and it kind of the back panel it kind of flexes which is real scary. And you can have to flex it and kind of maneuver the carriage back and forth to get it around it. It takes some some doing to get it out. But anyway, once I did, um, I was able to get to uh, easily to the mechanics of it and clean it. So the underneath side of the machine it has some nice hefty rubber feet, but the underneath side is open, so you have access to a lot of the parts in it. I wouldn't call it exactly a lap typer, just because of the open uh, mechanics underneath the machine. You want to probably put it on a, one of those lap desk uh, things, maybe, if you want a lap type with it. That being said, the typewriter itself is actually kind of intermediate in size and weight between an ultra portable and a larger portable typewriter. It's sort of an intermediate size. So the typewriter is 11 pounds, 7.5 ounces, minus the case, of course. Pretty heavy. I would say uh, it's obviously heavier than an ultra portable. 
Uh, and as far as the maximum height, the dimensions and all that, let's see, it looks like this corner up here on the front of the ribbon cover. Oh, this is my aunt's ruler. My dad's last surviving sibling, my Aunt Pat. This was her ruler, Patsy Van Cleve's ruler. Anyways, so the height of this is about four and a half inches, and the depth of it is about 12 and a quarter, and the width of it from carriage knob to carriage knob is about 13 inches. So it's a little bit bigger than an ultra portable, uh, a little shorter than a maybe a medium sized portable, and weighs in probably around where a medium sized portable is. The thing that you really notice about this machine, of course, right off the bat, is the plastic body. And it, after I got all the interior parts serviced, it, it took a lot of cleaning to get this cream or ivory colored plastic really clean. And it does show every little dirt smudge. If you touch the ribbon with your finger and then go touch this, you're going to have a, a black inky streak on it. So it does kind of show the dirt pretty easily. So it has this ribbon cover that articulates forward on these two arms right here, revealing the inside of the machine. And uh, it uses the Remington style spool. So these, the top covers of the spools come off and the ribbons themselves have a metal core that they fit onto these hubs in the middle. This has been around for a long time, this Remington uh, ribbon system. The ribbon itself does not use, it doesn't require a grommet for auto reversing. So these two guides right here are just guides for guiding the ribbon into the vibrator area. What this actually uses is the little tension arms right here, right? Those connect to some linkages down below that will activate the ribbon reverse when the uh, when the arm gets in inwards toward the middle of the pack. And uh, that was one of the problems that it had is it wasn't reversing actually. Actually it wasn't even f driving the ribbon onto this spool. It would drive it onto this spool but not this one. And that turned out to be underneath the machine where the shaft that turns this spindle, it connects to a plastic gear and that gear, the shaft that drives that was all gummed up. So that both of these I disassembled. And so now the supply spool, both of them, when they're functioning as a supply side, they turn very easily, which is what they should do, right? So underneath the machine, you have each of the ribbon drive systems has this plastic sprocket, and there is a, a round bushing, a hub in the middle with a set screw that holds it in place. And if you loosen that set screw, then you'll be able to pull the whole ribbon support disc, this whole disc right here, you'll be able to pull it up away from the machine and this metal bracket right here that you can see there's a hole that goes it's a casting and the shaft for that drive system goes through the, the hole in that casting and that hole was all gummed up with old oils and lubricants and it was keeping this ribbon spool from turning freely so I had to degrease both of those the same way uh, so another thing you see here inside the ribbon cover is this orange knob is the uh, touch adjustment and really what it is you screw it in like that and all you're doing is pushing down this lever and all that does is extend a spring inside the machine. It stretches a spring out to tighten up the tension and if you release it all the way like this to where it's not really pushing on this bracket that's about as light as the tension gets. As it is it feels somewhat like either a Brother or a uh, Silver Seiko kind of Japanese portable. It has that heavier kind of touch it's not quite as light of a touch as some of the more premium ultra portable typewriters. Uh, the keyboard itself here is a standard US style keyboard, a modern one with the number one exclamation mark, your typical fractions, a very standard keyboard for the US in this era. The backspace being on the left, uh, margin release being on the right. It has the tab button right here adjacent to the fraction key and there is a full key set tabulator right here uh, that you can set the tabs on so that's nice. Your ribbon color selector switch is here, your bichrome setting. And this was another problem that it had is the 
on the when it was sent to the black position the ribbon itself would not raise up at enough to do any printing and that turned out to be some gummed up linkages underneath there uh, so the keys on this typewriter have what you might call the chiclet style. They look like those little roundish square pieces of chiclet gum, chewing gum. And uh, so the keys are sort of a light grayish beige color, whereas the body of the typewriter is more of a yellowish cream color. Okay, so over on the carriage now on the right side is you have a carriage lock lever. If you pull forward, it'll release the, the carriage. So this is a full locking lever system. It'll protect the escapement when you're shipping the typewriter. One of the nice things about this machine is it has a carriage release lever on both sides of the platen. That's very nice. So starting over here on the right side, uh, you have your tension release lever for the feed rollers and of course your carriage release lever here. Paper bale, it has a flat paper bale with a, with a paper scale on it and underneath side of the paper bale is kind of half round. Uh, and it has these two rollers that are basically plastic, they're not really rubber at all. The problem this one had was the right hand feed roller wasn't really touching the paper so it, it was sort of easy to slip. And I had to reform the brackets here that form part of this arm to get both feed rollers so they have equal amounts of tension on the platen. So these are the typical push and slide kind of margins. These were a little gummed up. It took me, I had to take off the two side panels here which enabled me to get to the screws to take off the back panel and then that enabled me to take off the rack for the margin settings and the tabulator rack. All that needed to be cleaned and degreased but these are a lot smoother than they were. Uh, there is no paper support finger in the back but that doesn't really bother me. That's never been a problem for me. Here is the paper guide right here. So to get to the uh, margin rack and the tabulator rack which is behind this cover you first have to take off this platen knob which is accessed via a set screw you remove the platen knob pulls off and then enables you to take out the two screws here this side cover pulls out once that side covers out it reveals two screws behind here that you remove and then on the left side you basically unscrew the platen knob and that enables you to take the two screws out on the side piece here and take that side panel out off of the carriage return arm that reveals two more screws behind here that enables you to take off this back panel. Once the back panel's off then you can take two screws out that removes the margin rack and then two more screws removes the tabulator rack and you can clean behind those and it gives you good access into the back of the escapement as well. Uh, on the paper scale you might notice that it goes from 0 to 102 so this is an elite font machine. On the left side uh, you have of course your carriage release lever here and then this lever back here if you push it backwards it'll disengage the ratcheting of the line spacing but when you put it back it re reverts back to the original line spacing ratcheting whereas the button here on the left platen knob this is for permanently adjusting the line spacing uh, with a slip clutch. You push it in and it disengages a slip clutch. This is for if you had a piece of paper you've already been typing on, you remove from the machine, you put it back in, you want to continue typing. This is for lining up your lines to get the uh, variable set. Okay, line spacing. Uh, it has one, one and a half, two, two and a half, and three. So there's five different line spacing settings. This is a half space machine, meaning when you're on the single line spacing, the ratchet makes two clicks. So one and two. That second click is a little short, I've noticed. And so it also takes a little bit more tension. So when you're doing a carriage return, You'll do the one click, you wait for the carriage to come to a stop, and then you want to make sure you push it, continue pushing until it comes to a firm stop so the second click happens. If you don't do the second click, you're going to get overlapping lines. And so that's one of the things about this machine that is important to note. Um, I disassembled um, all of the side pieces to this typewriter. I took off a set screw down here on the right platen knob, pulled off the right platen knob. That enables me to take off the side panel by removing the two screws. On the left side, 
you unscrew the left platen knob and then you can pull it out. And then if you finagle with the underneath the erasing table, you kind of have to jimmy the platen out and you can finally release it from the uh, ratcheting system over here and remove the platen completely, clean the feed rollers, clean underneath the platen, and then reinstalling it is a little tricky because you have to make sure that this roller down here that engages the line spacing, this roller here that engages the line spacing ratcheting, you want to make sure this sprocket is lined up with that roller. It takes a little bit of trial and error to get this platen firmly in here all the way to the left so you can uh, reattach the platen knobs. And there's also a set of nuts that is underneath the right hand platen knob and you have to take out the outer nut to release it so you can get this right platen knob out and up. And putting it back in, you don't want to tighten this nut too much. You want to tighten it, but not, if you leave it too, too loose, then this side won't go in properly. So a little bit of adjustment needed there. Big thing was a lot of degreasing, old greases and dirt needed to be cleaned out of it. But overall, it's not too bad. So the underneath side of the machine here, you have these hard rubber feet, which look to be in pretty good shape. So one of the issues that I had was the shift lock, which is set by this bracket down here for the shift lock lever. Uh, the shift, the characters when you shift locked, they were higher than if you just shifted in the unlocked shift. And so this bracket had to be adjusted, which meant taking off the side pieces and coming in from the side and loosening those two screws and getting that bracket set. It took a number of tries to get it set properly so it would lock properly at, and type at the right uh, line, uh, even on the line, but then also enables you to release it by hitting the uh, shift button. So that was tricky. Now I had problems with sticking type bars on four specifically, even after doing a thorough cleaning out in the combs of the segment, it still was four of the keys. I think it was the R, the F, and the six and the seven. Those four keys were the type bars were sticking. And I found a good way to test for sticky type bars. This bar right here is the bar that the shifting pivots on, but behind it is another bar, and that bar is activated whenever you type a character, it moves like that, and that moves the ribbon system. And what I found is if you hold, if you push a key down and then hold your finger or something in there to keep this bar from returning, right, keep it up, and when you're doing that, at the same time, if you hold the typewriter up on its back side like it is now, while you're holding that bar up, uh, that ribbon bar helps return the type bars. So now the type bars are only going to be able to return under their own spring tension. Each linkage has its own spring. So when you test the linkages, you want to slowly press a key. The type bar goes down and you want to release it. And now it's, it's working against gravity. It's having to pull its own weight back up to the return position. And it's only going to be powered by its own spring when it does it. So you'll be able to tell if there's any sticky type bars. They just, they'll just be resistant to coming back up under their own force, their own pressure. So let me uh, activate that bar here. Okay, I'm going to hold that bar from returning. And now, see now you can see, see the R is a little sluggish, the T is faster, the Y is faster, the E. The R is just a little slower. See that? It's just a little more sluggish. That still has a little bit of sluggishness to it. Ah, look at that. The 7. The 7 is a little bit sluggish still. So th this is a good way to test for these intermittent sticking type bars. Turn it on its backside. Pull that ribbon linkage bar back. So now the keys have to return under their own spring pressure only. Now the quality of imprint is pretty good. Uh, you'll see the layout here, and there is though a little bit of kind of ghosting, a little bit on, on the to the right of some of the letters, the lowercase like the B and the S and even the M, the J, quite a few of them. Then the uppercase, the W is rather blurry, and there is some blurring also on like the ampersand, or I'm sorry, the at and the M and a few of the other characters. So um, I was interested in what was going on with that. So I noticed that in the case of the W, if you were to shift it, let's say shift lock, and if I was to push it in there by hand and 
press it forcefully, it makes a nice, crisp, clean W. But um, what it's actually doing when you let it type itself is I think the the type slug is hitting, is rubbing on the right side of the type guide as it's entering the type guide slot. And what that does is it causes the type bar to slide slightly to the left as it's printing. So it kind of slides to the left. And I suspect a lot of the other characters are doing that also. Like if I take one of the lowercase ones, like the M, It feels like it's it might be hitting the right side of the guide also. So it's possible someone at one time has um, misadjusted that type guide. And so to get to them, you can see these two screws. This is the back side of the screws. Uh, the heads of those screws are underneath the machine and really hard to get to. It looks like if I shift lock the machine and underneath here, it's really going to be hard to get to those screws. I don't think I can get to them with a screwdriver. So it's going to be challenging to see how I can possibly adjust those. They were probably factory adjusted and maybe somebody has adjusted them, misadjusted them, not really sure. But in any event, it's possible that this type guide is slightly out of adjustment. Or the alternative is maybe a lot of the type bars are just bent a little bit and they need to be straightened out, which is probably what I'll do first. So in the case of the W, I'm going to just probably have to slightly reform that type bar a little to the left so it goes more into the middle of that slot without rubbing. My thoughts on this typewriter, it is an interesting machine. I'm not going to give it kind of a numerical score or anything. It's a not a bad machine. It's pretty good. Um, it is a little bit loud and rattly when you operate it, mainly because of the plastic panels. I think you could probably put some adhesive felt on the inside of this, you, the kind that you get from a craft store, inside the body panels under the ribbon cover, and that would probably go a long way toward helping to alleviate that. Uh, there is this uh, underneath surface of the ribbon cover that just sits on these plastic rails, and maybe a little bit of adhesive craft felt in there also would kind of keep that, if there's a little bit of vibrating or rattling, going on while you're typing. That would help to quiet it also. So there's some things a hobbyist could do to make this a little bit quieter. Overall impressions, well, it's not quite as big as a bigger portable typewriter like a 5 Series Smith Corona or whatever, but it's certainly bigger than an ultra portable. The footprint is probably about the same as an ultra portable, but the height of it's a little bit taller and of course the weight. It has a carriage release levers on both knobs. That's nice. It has a full key set tabulator, that's nice. And uh, it doesn't have a paper support in the back. That may or may not be a problem. It's not really an issue with me, actually. I don't really care one way or the other. I like the longer carriage return arm that also folds down like that for storage. So you can lock the carriage in place. It is an actual lock that keeps the escapement from being damaged and then you push the lever down and now you can move and carry this typewriter around. As far as being a portable typewriter though, in the case, you know, this big clunky case, the case is a little too thick and actually I think the typewriter might be right on the edge of being a little too tall to carry successfully in a uh, shoulder bag, a messenger style bag, which is how I like to carry portable typewriters when I'm out uh, going around and going to coffee shops or whatever. It is a little heavy, so it's not really easy to carry portable typewriter that you would want to carry around everywhere you go. And since that's the case, and if you're going to be leaving this machine more at home as a desk office writer, you know there's better machines designed to be fixed and used in a fixed location. They're bigger machines that just are built nicer, work better. So. This isn't a bad machine by any any means. If this was your only typewriter, I'm sure you could get to love it, but it's kind of mediocre in many ways to me. Too big to be an ultra portable, doesn't operate nice enough, doesn't have a nice enough touch to be a better machine that would be stationary at, in your home office. So. Those are my feelings about the Remington 1040, but you know what? I think it's a good rugged machine to give to a young person if you want to get them interested in a typewriter. And I might want to see how my young grandson takes to this after now that I've fixed it up a little bit, see if he wants to play with it. If he doesn't want to use it, this machine would actually be pretty good for use in type-in events, right? Public typewriters, you want them to be rugged, 
durable. You don't want them to be flimsy or easy to break or have odd controls that are hard to understand how to use by the layman. So this would actually be a good type in typewriter, if nothing else. What are your thoughts about the Remington 1040? Do you like them? Do you uh, have one? Are your impressions of a Remington 1040 better than what I've presented here? Maybe my machine just needs a little bit more cleaning and degreasing. Maybe the heavy touch. Maybe it needs more work. I don't know. But tell me your experiences down there in the comments about the Remington 1040s. What do you think? Well, until next time, stay creative, keep writing, and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.